In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have a, a, a feast today particular to the Carmelite order, and that is of Saint uh, Elijah the prophet, uh, also known as Saint Elias. So you have Elijah and Elias, same person. Then you have Elisha and Eliseus, same person. So four names, two people. Uh, it can be a little difficult to keep them straight uh, due to the different translations. But anyway, um, so we, so uh, I don't know of any other. Well, this is a this is a, a feast day, Saint Elijah. Uh, the church, even in the sixty two calendar, tends or no doesn't celebrate any Old Testament saints. We would say King David, Solomon, Elijah, the prophets. Um, they're on the calendar, but or sorry, they they have feast days, but they're not on the calendar. If I could say that in the in the old uh, in the old um, sixty two. Uh, but even we have here in the uh, the Carmelite order, uh, he is, you know, very, and, and as we know, we just celebrated the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel on the 16th. And in fact, in the old Carmelite calendar, uh, there's an octave for Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So this is a Feast of St. Elijah within the octave of the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So quite appropriate. Uh, but uh, Elijah appears in the Old Testament in the third, um, sorry, uh, what does he want to do? Yeah, the third book of Kings, if you're following the Dewey Reams uh, calculating, it's one and two Kings, three and four Kings. Uh, there's another, the kind of the more modern method, which is one and two Samuel, one and two Kings. So you do have to keep that in mind. If you see one Kings, it might be three Kings. Or, you know, it might be one Kings. Or if you see three Kings, that's definitely okay. Three Kings is definitely, there's no other option. Anyways, so three Kings, according to Dewey Reams, chapter 17, we start hearing about the prophet Elijah. <clears throat> and this is um, 900 BC. So this is there's nearly a thousand years before Christ. And it is about, oh, I don't know, I, I think not quite a hundred years after um, King David. Uh, so it was King David, well, there's King Saul, the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. And then there was King David, and then there was King Solomon. And that was it. After those three kings, the nation of Israel was divided and remained divided ever since. Like for the next thousand years, it was split. And that was after F. Solomon were, had been very hard on the people of Israel. And his, uh, his son, his successor, they asked him to... Um, uh, make eat, lighten the load and Solomon's son uh, you know, Come on those things Solomon was was wise up until the end and his son was just never wise absolutely foolish His son said uh, my father was hard on you, but I will be even more hard um, So the, the people split so you had north and south kingdom and uh, In the southern kingdom you had Jerusalem and it was called Judah the, the nation of Judah and they had Jerusalem Bethlehem It was a southern kingdom in the northern kingdom was called the kingdom of Israel. So you had Israel and Judah. Um, and Israel was just, once it split, it never recovered. Israel was always falling into idolatry. Israel was, um, because the temple was in the southern kingdom, Judah, Judah tended to remain mostly um, worshiping God, worshiping Yahweh uh, in Jerusalem, in the temple where they were supposed to. In the northern kingdom, they didn't have the temple. They didn't have Jerusalem and they couldn't worship. And so what do they do? Almost continually for the whole uh, existence of the nation of Israel, the divided kingdom in the north, you would have the kings um, encouraging people, set up your own altars in your own areas and worship God uh, in your own way. So, and, and that was the problem. That was why they were called Samaritans in the north. That was kind of like the leftover practice of the northern kingdom, which was not going to Jerusalem to worship, but was worshiping God um, on every high hill and on, under every green tree, right? You see that a lot in um, the Old Testament. Um, so this began really um, in earnest, the fifth king of Israel after, um, after Solomon, and then there was his, um, his son, I think it was Rehoboam, but then there was uh, Jeroboam, that's it. Jeroboam was, Jeroboam was the first king of Israel. Uh, five kings after him was Omri. And Omri, King Omri, arranged a marriage between uh, his son Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel was a, uh, I think a Phoenician or Philistine uh, princess. 
And Ahab and Jezebel, uh, Jezebel brought in the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtaroth. That's where they came from. They came from Philistia. Um, Baal was a god of the sky. So, sorry, all of this is like background. Uh, and this is, this is the, the um, time and the, um, when uh, Elijah the prophet enters into the picture. He comes into a divided kingdom. The south is still worshiping Yahweh. The north has completely abandoned God, is worshiping false gods and Yahweh at the same time or, or one or the other. It's a mess. So this is 3 Kings 17. Elijah comes in and uh, God warns Elijah that he is going to bring a drought upon the land, as I mentioned in my sermon a few days ago, uh, symbolizing the with, with withholding of graces. Elijah tells Ahab that there will be three years of catastrophic drought, and um, this is because he is, is kind of a culmination of a long line of kings. There was five kings before him, all of whom have done evil. And this was, uh, when, when Elijah prophesies a drought, uh, that was understood, especially by Jezebel and those false prophets of Baal, as a challenge, because Baal was the god of the sky, the god of lightning, the god of thunder, and the god of rain. And so one prophet is telling essentially 950 prophets or 850, my one God is more powerful than, you know, one prophet is more powerful than all of you. Your, your God is the God of the sky and of rain, but my God is more powerful uh, because your God doesn't exist. He's a demon. It's Satan and, and, and his minions. So this was a challenge and it was, it, it was, uh, it became true. You know, for three years, you have those false prophets of Baal you know, trying to get Baal to send rain upon the earth. And of course, you can imagine they're telling the people, oh, Baal is upset because of this. Baal is upset because of that. Meanwhile, it's been prophesied, it's gonna, there's going to be a drought until you return to the Lord. That's, that's the prophet Elijah. Um, God tells, and then, you know, you go through the story, right? Um, so God uh, has Elijah give this prophecy to Ahab, and then God tells Elijah, go, go down by the... Um, uh, the, I think that was the, the, the Wadi Kebron, and he's fed there by ravens, and then the brook there dries up because of the famine. Then he sends him to the widow of Zerapath, right? He goes to this widow woman, and she's got one son, and he lives there and says, you know, bring me some food. And she says, I've, I've got a little corn and a little oil, then we're going to die because there's a drought and we have no more. Uh, and he tells her to not fear, and then the, the, the pot of um, meal does not dry up. The oil continues un until through the drought. And then he, he raises also her son dies and he raises him from the, raises him from the dead. This is all in the, the book of Kings, the third book of Kings. Um, eventually, after the end of this three years, uh, the, um, that showdown between Elijah and the prophets occurs. And um, I won't go into the details because we've already heard of those on Sunday. Uh, but Elijah says to the people, he summons not just the, is the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 uh, prophets of Ashtaroth, and also a great multitude of the people of Israel. And he berates them there on Mount Carmel. He says, how long will you go on limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 3 Kings 18. So then that's when Elijah, um, there, was, there was an altar to the Lord on Mount Carmel, a stone altar. And Elijah repairs the stones, lifts, um, uh, builds them up, puts a sacrifice on there. And as we know, the fire comes down and consumes the bull, the, the stones, uh, the, the, the earth on the ground, and all the water Elijah poured on it. And the people declare, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And all the people seize the prophets and uh, put them to death, as we know. Uh, now, after that... Um, and Jezebel is enraged that Elijah has done this to uh, her 850 prophets. And she says, you know, uh, such and such may, you know, the gods do to me if I do not make you like one of those prophets by this time tomorrow, right? And this is, this is curious that Elijah flees from the face of Jezebel. He has just, you know, called down fire from heaven and, and put these prophets to the sword. And yet he, he, he uh, uh, flees in uh, fear of Jezebel, the, the evil queen. Well, he continues into the wilderness and sits down under this tree and he prays for death. He says, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, strike me down for I am no better than my father's. Uh, kind of an interesting comment. Uh, so he falls asleep under the tree. The angel of the Lord touches him and he wakes up and he sees a jug of water and a hearth cake. And the angel says, uh, take and eat. And he does so. He eats the cake and drinks the water and then falls asleep again. The angel touches him once more. Same thing. Take and eat, for thou hast a long journey. 
And then Elijah travels 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. And that's interesting. Again, anytime we hear 40 days and 40 nights or anything, we should think that this period here of Elijah traveling to Mount Horeb, we should be thinking of uh, the flood, 40 days and 40 nights of rain, and Christ the Lord in the desert. Uh, 40, 40 days in the desert. Also the Israelites, you know, 40 years in the desert. They're, they're all connected. Uh, so Elijah travels this to Mount Horeb, which other name is Mount Sinai, which is where Moses received the Ten Commandments. And that is where Elijah hides in the cave and our Lord uh, speaks to Elijah. And he wasn't in the firestorm, he wasn't in the earthquake, he wasn't in the, the great wind and rain. Uh, our Lord is in the gentle breeze, right? And then Elijah comes out and says, here I am, Lord, speak. And Yahweh gives him a mission at that point. He sends him to Damascus to anoint Hazael uh, as king uh, of Israel. Uh, Jehu, uh, Jehu is king of Israel, uh, Hazael is king of Aram, and he also tells him you'll need to um, appoint Elisha, uh, your servant, as your replacer, or your successor. Um, and there's, there's a few more instances of, of interaction with Elijah and Ahab and Ahab's son, uh, Ahaziah. Um, but his, his departure eventually is in uh, the, uh, 4 Kings chapter 2. And uh, Elijah and Elisha uh, travel to the mountain, and Elijah know that he's going to be um, uh, taken up into heaven, or at least that he's going to be received by God, however, whatever that may be. Uh, they go to, I think, believe it's the River Jordan, and Elijah strikes the river with his cloak, and it parts, and they cross. They go up to the mountain, and that is when Elijah is taken up in the fiery chariot, hence the red garments for today's Mass. I don't know of any other saint who has red that isn't a martyr other than Elijah. And it's, it's because of the, the fire, you know, with which he was taken up. Um, and it says that, that um, Elijah actually did not die. He was assumed into heaven. We think of the assumption of the Blessed Virgin, body and soul into heaven. Um, she wasn't the only one. Well, she was the only one um, assumed actually into heaven because it was Enoch and Elijah were the only two men who did not die upon the earth, but says the Lord took them, right, body and soul out of this earth. Where are they? That's a, a subject of great speculation in that where are Elijah and Enoch? Um, and it says they must return before the world ends. They will return and die because it is appointed all men once to die. So those two men still have to die uh, wherever they may be right now. So, uh, you know, much speculation about that. Uh, but also um, Elijah was one of the, one of the men uh, who appeared to Christ on the at the transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appeared speaking with him. Moses and Elijah, of course, were rep representing Moses, represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets. So of all the Old Testament prophets, Elijah was the greatest of them, uh, uh, succeeded only by John the Baptist, right? So it's John the Baptist, then Elijah, then all the rest. So uh, Elijah is um, taken up into heaven, and he leaves his cloak back behind for El um, uh, Elisha also Eliseus, and Elisha takes it. Remember when he says, uh, he sees uh, Elijah <laughs> departing, he says, my father, my father, uh, uh, the, 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 the chariot and the driver there of Israel thereof. And he, he takes Elijah's cloak and goes back, you know, strikes the water, crosses the Jordan, and continues that uh, 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 mission of prophecy. Elisha also asks of Elijah, he asks of him a double portion. He says, give to me a double portion uh, of, of, of thy power. And it didn't mean twice the power of Elijah. It meant that when, when a father divided up his um, uh, inheritance among his sons, he would give the oldest a double portion. If he had four sons, he would divide his property in five and give the oldest son two-fifths and everybody else one-fifth. That's what a double portion means. So Elisha asked for that from Elijah. Um, and so after that, that's the end of, of Elijah's um, uh, mission on this earth. He, um, in the Bible, we have him mentioned a few more times. He is uh, referenced in Ecclesiastes, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, epistle for today, uh, as, as being, you know, a great prophet of God and so on. Elijah is also mentioned in uh, the book of Two Chronicles, uh, which is he sends a, a letter under, under the prophet Elijah, sends a letter to um, one of the kings of Judah, um, telling him he has led the people of Judah astray in the same way Israel has done, upbraiding him, telling him to return to, the, uh, to Yahweh. The final mention of Elijah in the Old Testament is in the book of Malachi. 
And this is the final book, the last book of the Old Testament, and it is written, uh, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Uh, and as we know, uh, Elijah the prophet was sent before the great and awesome day of the Lord. That was the transfiguration, as I mentioned. And the day of the Lord, of course, was uh, Sunday, the resurrection. The day the Lord rose from the dead, completely defeated sin and death. Um, and, and Elijah did precede that. So that prophecy was fulfilled. And he mentions, you know, turning the hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers. So many ways you can understand that. Uh, one of them is uh, the priest and the people. The priests are to be the fathers of the people. The people are the, are the children of, of the priests. And you know, you, you have, you're gonna have at Israel in the time and throughout history, the priests and the people opposed. You have faithless priests who are not taking care of their people and you have people who are not respecting their priests. Uh, we can see that very easily today in, in the very many bad priests who are leading people astray. They don't care about the people at all. They're in it for themselves, the, the corrupt hierarchy as we know. But you also see the other way around. You see people not respecting priests and, and, and uh, falsely accusing them, taking advantage of them, and so on. So that that's, can be one, way, one of the ways in which that prophecy was uh, to be understood, uh, the priesthood and the people. And that's always going to have been a problem. Right? You read in the Old Testament all the time, like the sons of Heli, uh, they, were, they were priests and they were, they were preying upon the people. Uh, so thus, a, um, a not even uh, just kind of a brief outline of the prophet Elijah. And we forget that, that this, in the Old Testament, that was God's church and that was God's people upon earth. Um, uh, the, the Catholic Church didn't, we'd say God's chosen people is the Catholic Church now. But, but the Catholic Church is continuing the Old Testament Israelites. This is not a new thing. It's not like, yeah, the, the Jews today, the, the, you know, they can claim a, a, a stronger heritage of the Old Testament. No, they can't. The Jews today have, have less to do with the Old Testament than the Catholic Church does. We have far more to do with, with, with them and so on. That is, our heritage and our inheritance is the Jews of the Old Testament. The Jews these days, nothing to do with them. Nothing to do with them except uh, an empty claim. Um, just to note, too, that the difference between Old Testament and New Testament saints, in the Old Testament, God himself was doing so much. God was sending fire from heaven. God was, it was directly God. The prophets were just saying, this is what God's going to do, and then God did it, and everybody saw it. Since Christ, uh, in fulfillment of the Old Testament, I will put my law in their hearts. No one will say to his neighbor, know ye the Lord, for they will all know it. And that is um, uh, Ezekiel 33. Um, God doesn't act from heaven, he acts through us. God acts through the saints. And, and when we see that all the time through St. Vincent de Paul, saints like uh, today, Jerome Emiliani, um, they, they ran orphanages, hospitals, schools, uh, they, they worked wonders, but it was God working through us. That's how he wanted, wants to do now. He doesn't want to come down from heaven and do it himself. He already did that all through the Old Testament and finally in the, in, in, with Christ himself. Christ himself. He wants to work through us. Miracles, wonders, uh, great power, that's what he's looking for. As I always say, uh, do your daily prayers, uh, make use of the grace of your baptism and the sacraments. That is how uh, uh, God will change the world uh, through us. We can participate, he wants us to participate. Uh, so let us renew, renew our desires uh, to be generous with God and courageous uh, to the world. Um, uh, Saint Elijah, pray for us. God bless you all. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for listening. Please remember to click subscribe and to hit the bell for notifications. And in this age of censorship, please consider helping support us at sensefidelium.com. Under the Donate and Support tab, there are plenty of ways to help support the work and to help grow and sustain the efforts of Census Fidelium in general. May God reward you, and thank you very much.